the slides are not going to be very beautiful. They're going to be kind of cluttered, but hopefully you'll get the message anyway. Uh, so I wasn't exactly sure exactly what would be useful for people who are interested in doing science communication. So basically I have just kind of put together a whole bunch of the things that I have learned on my strange path uh, to doing science communication. And I have done lots of different sorts of things, and I know lots of people who are in journalism and they do science communication. And so some of this is pulled from my own experience and some is from their experience. And it's kind of broad in general, and I'm happy to answer more specific questions if you have them either um, now after I'm done or maybe you want to contact me later. And anything I don't know right away, I probably have contacts that I can get in touch with and ask uh, for their opinions as well. So hopefully I can be quite useful to you in some way or another. Um, so the thing about science communication is that there are lots of opportunities for you. And I think a lot of people find this to be kind of an attractive idea because they like science, but they don't want to be stuck doing academics and worrying about grants and teaching and all that sort of stuff. Um, that is certainly one of the reasons why I have always found it to be quite an appealing thing. And the nice thing is that it kind of caters to a range of, of expertises and interests. So whether you're kind of a visual person and you want to do photography and videography, or you're more of an acoustics person and you want to do kind of um, you know, radio broadcast or podcast, or if you go with the written word and want to produce something that someone's going to read, there is an opportunity for you to do science communication. And there are lots of positions that kind of involve all of those things um, all at once. So if you want to work in a museum, maybe, or if you want to uh, be an educator in a classroom, you have the opportunity to kind of put all of these different multimedia skills uh, in action all at once. So it can be quite an interesting and stimulating and fun sort of thing for you as well as the people that ultimately get what it is that you're producing. Um, so just to give you an idea of my own experience, this is probably not an exhaustive list of what's out there if you want to do science communication, but it's kind of a, a broad general category. category. And these are all the things that I've been involved with, which I really think goes to show that if you kind of get started, you can get on a roll and start doing lots of different things. Uh, the nice thing about these sorts of opportunities is that they really range widely in terms of whether it's a volunteer position or a paid position, whether you're doing it part-time or freelance, whether you are um, then hired on, you're doing it full-time. I mean, it really is all over the place. So you can start off just kind of dabbling in it and seeing how you like it doing it for fun, and you can eventually find a, a way to make that into a full-time career, depending on what your interests are most of the time. Uh, and again, here's where we start having no animation. I'm sorry for all this overwhelming information. I'll walk you through it. So basically what I have is kind of three main steps that I think are important for helping yourself become a science communicator. And the first of these is kind of very obvious and fundamental. That's that you actually have to work on your communication skills and ha practicing the communication and coming up with stuff that you do. And I think that the first thing you have to do is to be aware of the kind of things that you're interested in and to then kind of pursue those. And it really helps if you have a list of ideas of all the things that you've thought of that would maybe have wings as something that you can sell or, or distribute in some way. So you need to kind of just keep your eye on what's happening in the field, whatever field you're interested in. See what kind of current events are going on, how you can tie things in together. Because you know anything that has to do with communication these days is moving incredibly fast. There's a huge turnover. The news cycle is really short, and they just want new stuff all the time. And that is true no matter what kind of medium you're working in. So you want to have this big bank of ideas that you can turn to at any given time that you want to take one of those ideas and run with it. And one thing that I would suggest for helping you do this is to look at the original literature. And while you're here, you have access for free to a huge number of journals. And you will likely miss that when you're gone, because if you're interested in things and you want to read the primary stuff, it is really expensive if you're not at an institution. And it's a real hassle to try to write every single author and ask for so really take advantage of the literature while you have it at your fingertips for free and get as many things as you can. If you can't read them right away, just kind of stockpile them and kind of keep a list of what are the new cutting edge things that are happening in whatever field that you're most interested in. I also suggest that you think 
about your own personal experiences. And this seems like kind of a silly thing because it, it maybe seems like not as scientific. Uh, but, <clears throat> sorry. But when I first started out, the very first thing that I published was uh, an essay about my own experience with Alan. And it was just actually something that I kind of did because I liked writing and I just wrote it down. And then I thought later that maybe I could sell it somewhere, and it turned out that I could. Uh, and that's actually what, well, I probably have a pointer, I don't know. Oops, no, that's not it. Um, that's what the squirrel picture is up there. So I was working out in the field, and these squirrels were always around. They're an endangered species, and I saw one of them die, this horrendous death right in front of me. And I wrote about this, and I ended up selling that rather morbid essay to uh, a nature magazine. And you know, that kind of thing, you don't, you don't normally think about those sorts of things to, to sell to other people all the time. But the truth is that you all have your own experiences, whether that's in the lab, whether it's during our field trips, whether it's as a student. Um, you have things that you do that are quite interesting and useful to other people. And these can be a springboard into something that you can communicate. And in fact, there is a whole blog that is devoted to having people write in and just kind of help other people out by expressing their own experiences. So people who work in a lab and maybe routinely encounter certain problems that go wrong over and over again, they'll write a little essay about how to avoid you know, the top five mistakes that you'll make in a lab. And those are students often who will write that. And so you right now could go home and, and use your own experiences to write something that would then be posted on this blog tomorrow. Uh, and these sorts of experiences are out there in a number of different places. Another thing you should do is try to kind of find your sources of inspiration. And I know this sounds horribly unscientific and you know, we're verging on the arts here. But it is quite useful to know the things that will stimulate you and make you uh, produce whatever it is that you're interested in producing. And that's because almost inevitably, you will arrive at a point where you are tired and you maybe have writer's block or whatever sort of block if you're not a writer. And it will be quite hard for you to kind of have the energy and the motivation and um, just kind of the, the idea of what you're going to write about in order to, to then produce something. And so if you are aware of the kind of people that you need to be in touch with or places that you need to go or things that you need to do, that can be quite useful for you to kind of make sure you can put yourself into a situation from which some sort of communication will arise. And this is, um, you know, for me, for example, I, I study birds and I like to birding, and often when I'm out birding, just for fun, I will see things that happen that I could then write about in a scientific article. <clears throat> Sorry, this all week I've been totally fine, and today I'm lecturing and I've started getting sick. Um, but when I go out birding, I'll see birds doing strange behaviors, or I might see an odd weather pattern, or I might see some sort of interesting ecological interaction, and then I can go back and take that experience and look at the primary literature and come up with some sort of a piece of writing about that. And so, you know, knowing that I could go put myself into that and come up with something, most likely, is quite a useful piece of information in case I'm ever stuck and I'm not sure what I'm going to write about. Something else that's really useful for you guys, whether you intend to become scientists and, and stay in science or do anything else, especially communication, is that you attend um, events and, like workshops and conferences and seminars and things like that. because. They're useful for a number of reasons, um, but one of them is that you do get inspiration because you kind of find out what's been happening, what's brand new in the field, what's kind of coming up, because people will often talk about preliminary work. You'll get a chance to find out who the big players are and have, have an opportunity to talk to them and ask them questions. A lot of what goes on at conferences, you may already know this, uh, basically happens after hours at pubs. People get together and talk about science um, over a few pints nerdy, but it's totally true. Um, science is done in pubs. And, and if you get a chance to be a part of that, then you will kind of really put your finger on the pulse of what's going on in science. And that's true across the field, and that's going to be quite a useful thing. Uh, just for kind of networking as well as getting ideas about what, what you can write about. Uh, I should mention I will kind of default to saying writing. Uh, because that's what I do and that's what most people tend to be interested in. But these same sorts of, of ideas apply to them generally. If you're talking about podcasting or having a YouTube video or whatever, all these same sorts of principles apply. So something else you'll want to do, if, if you're not able to go to conferences or in addition to going to conferences, 
I really recommend that you kind of track down the major players in the field and look them up online. And visit their websites, find out who people are. Also do the same thing for organizations. Uh, so if you're interested in conservation, go to the WWF or whatever kind of websites. And just kind of have a look and, and find out who the major players are and what's going on. And find out what websites that you can follow or what feeds you can follow in order to always find out what's new and what's happening. And that will be quite useful for you because, again, uh, communicating is generally about either finding something new and broadcasting it or putting a new spin on something that's already known. And so you have to continually have a source of information yourself that you can then spin um, often from a primary source into something that's accessible not to, to non-academics and to lay people. So you yourself uh, need to have that constant source of information that you can then turn around in a digestible format. And this is what full-time journalists will do as well. Uh, my dad is a journalist, for instance, in the US, and at his news agency, they have a feed that comes in from these national uh, people like AP, Associated Press, or Reuters, and they just have this feed, and then they take things off the feed and rewrite them for their audience. The same thing is true of journalists in any field and in any country. And finally, something that I kind of re-emphasize throughout this whole talk is the fact that you should try to diversify and be creative as much as possible. So wh whatever it is that you're most interested in, try also doing that same kind of that same information that you might broadcast in that way, try broadcasting it in another way as well. So if you think that you want to be a magazine writer or a newspaper writer, why not try pulling out a camera and doing that as a news broadcast and sticking it up on YouTube? Why not try recording yourself talking and have a podcast of that same thing? Um, because the truth is that, that that information, you'll need to adjust it slightly for each one of those formats. And if you have experience with those sorts of adjustments, and if you create an output of each one of those adjustments, you, know, you can then show to someone and show them that you know how to do that and you know those differences, that will be very useful. And it will be useful for you um, as well. So for instance, before I came here, I interviewed for a job that I was actually offered but I decided not to take. Uh, and the job was as a science communicator at an ornithology lab. And one of the things that they did during the the whole process of the interview was that they listed a whole suite of things that I might be involved with and asked me how I would do those things. Did I have any experience with them? Um, they wanted to know, and for most of them I didn't. I'd never made a documentary. At that point I'd never made a website. Um, but they wanted to know my level of, of experience. And then they said, okay, based on what you've seen, how do you think you would need to take information and change it in order to be you know, fitting for those formats? And so for the first time ever, I was just kind of put on the spot and I had to think, what do you do with scientific information when you want to make a video documentary? What do you do when you want to conduct an interview and put it on the radio? So if you have experience thinking about those differences ahead of time, it will be quite useful if you ever have people asking you these sorts of questions. And one final thing is that I would really suggest paying attention to what's happening in current events. And this often can lead you down a path that you think maybe a bit goofy or cheesy, but it is true that uh, whoever, your, whoever your audience is and whoever you're trying to sell to, they do want something that's new and kind of pertinent and seems relevant. And one way to do that is to make sure that you make things timely and topical. And pretty much anyone you ask in journalism will agree with this. So for example, uh, we just had Halloween, and during my radio show this week, I did a Halloween themed broadcast and I talked about the science behind monsters, um, which sounds like kind of a silly thing, but actually when you start, you know, you can, you can take things like that and make them quite intelligent, quite scientific, um, because you are all scientists, and so you have that ability to not stray too far into the cheese. And being able to do this sort of thing is quite useful because people love having things that are timely. So around the Olympics, for instance, everyone wanted something about the science of being an athlete. Uh, you know, what, what role do genes play, what role does the environment play, that sort of stuff. So if you are capable of kind of catering to that desire, then you are going to put yourself in good stead to be able to market yourself and sell pieces during these sorts of events. Okay. The second thing is, uh, once you have all this huge suite of
of ideas that you've thought about, you've stockpiled all these things and you've started kind of playing around, you need to then actually have a portfolio. So not just stuff that you've done on your own computer sitting at home that you've played around with, but things you've actually sold or in some way or another put out there for the environment, um, in the environment for the public to digest. And you can do this in lots of different ways. Obviously, there are many different formats that are now considered valid. Um, you know, 10 years ago, if you wanted to be a videographer and you said, oh, I have a YouTube channel, someone would say, well, who cares? That's just for fun. But now there are people who become professionals and are professional through their YouTube channel. So there are lots of opportunities for you, even if you're not actually being paid by any organization yet at this point. So first of all, the kind of basic rule here is that you need to make yourself obvious. You need to have a list of things that you can put on a CV that show that you were active and that you got yourself out there. It's so like legitimate things that, that are not just, you know, I, I wrote a class assignment. Um, you need to, so if, if people are interested in maybe hiring you in some way, you need to be able to refer them to an actual thing that you've produced that other people accessed. One way that you can do that, <coughs> that a lot of people don't tend to think about, is you can enter a contest. Um, there are actually lots of writing contests, and some of them are associated with jobs or internships or money um, or just prestige in the end, and all those things can be useful to you. And I actually have recently done this, even though um, I, you know, I, I'm not really at the stage, I don't really need to do this, but it can be kind of fun as well. And so for example, my hometown is having a contest where they want to, they want to find someone who can do a photography or writing or photography and writing product that, that advertises them as a great place to so I made an entry and I put it into this contest. And I, I did that not because I really care that much about my hometown, but because I wanted the challenge of doing such a thing. And I wanted to also showcase the fact that I can do both photography and writing. And I wanted to have it broadcast. Because what they're doing is collecting all of these entries, and most of these sorts of contests will have a similar thing. They'll collect them all and then put them online. And so already there have been over a thousand people, at least last time I checked, who had gone and seen this. Now, many of those thousands of people won't really be relevant to me in any way, but you never know when one of them will be. And the truth is, and I will keep saying this again and again, that opportunities will come if you do these sorts of things and put yourself out there. So chances are that eventually, if you do enough of this sort of thing, one of those thousands of people that come by will be someone who contacts you for another opportunity. So you never know. It doesn't hurt to try. Something else that you might want to do that seems a little bit more helpful and realistic is finding out where you can volunteer or freelance. Um, volunteering obviously doesn't have much of a payback except for the chance of having experience and getting yourself in there. Uh, freelance, you can actually make some money while you're doing this. If you're in an organization, a club of some sort, and you have the opportunity to be a press person, to write the newsletter, go for it. Because you can actually put on your CV that you did the communications for X, Y, and Z organizations. And that is something that is legitimate that you can put. You can make a PDF of that product that you have created, and then you can put that on a, web, a website or attach it to um, a job, um, what's the word when you apply for job, application. Um, and you can send that in, and it will be something that you have as a physical piece of proof that you can do this sort of stuff. And freelancing is even better because that is an paid job, so it also is, you can have a reference then as someone who was your boss who looked over your work and said that it was acceptable. But either way, it's good to actually you know, do these things in an active sort of way. Now, if, if you look around and you don't see any things that, are, that seem to be available to you at any given time, then you also can go out there and actively try to create these chances. Um, so one thing that you could do, for example, is approach I've written up here publisher, but you can substitute uh, producer or editor or whatever is the appropriate word. You can approach someone and pitch an idea directly to them. So if you have an idea for a column that you might write for a newspaper, then you can approach the newspaper and say, could you make room for this on a weekly basis? Or maybe even you know, just, just once every now and then or just one time. Uh, you can go to a radio station and say, I would really like to contribute you know, one, one story, would you be willing to air that story if, if, I, you know, if, you, if you look through it first and say it's okay. You can pitch a book idea. If you have a book idea, you can 
find a publisher and write to them and say, here's what I'd like to write. And so, you know, all this stuff that kind of seems inaccessible at first, it seems a bit scary to start doing this, but lots of people do this, and you can make that opportunity yourself. Uh, you can also just go out and self-publish. Lots of people self-publish ebooks, so if you are actually writing a book, um, you could just publish it yourself. And you can have a blog, and you can publish that yourself. And these days, blogs are something legitimate that you can put on a CV that you can send to a potential employer. So even if you can't approach someone else to be your publisher, you can just go and be your own publisher. Uh, and those last, actually, those last couple ideas about the blog, for example, that is a really important point um, because that's one of many ways in which you can create a web presence. And I know that Sarah has already emphasized this when she gave her talk uh, when you guys did your web pages, but it really is something you cannot emphasize enough. Having a web presence is essential. And we did this the same exercise that we did with you guys. We did it with the third years as well. And they really dug in their heels. Some of them did not want to do this. And I just, I cannot stress how important it is because people will Google you. They want to find out about you. And if all you have up there is you partying on Facebook, that's not good. <laughs> and it's even better if you go beyond just having a LinkedIn site um, and beyond even just having you know, the, the professional kind of looking Google site that you just set up to having something that actually showcases examples of what you have done. Actually, you can do this on LinkedIn now as well. You can, you can link to uh, excerpts from things you've written or attach PDFs and that sort of thing. And it is a really good idea to do this. You need to get yourself on there looking professional and showing off your portfolio. So create a portfolio uh, from scratch if you have to. You know, Throw it up all on, on a blog and then, and then attach that. or. Um, Take stuff that you've already done, but make sure that you have it in PDF form online that people can access and download and look at. I cannot tell you how many times editors have asked me if they can see samples of my writing. And if I can just direct them to a link, then, then I have not only made it easier on myself, I don't have to attach five different PDFs, but I can also show off the fact that I've made a website and I can inadvertently show them all the other stuff I've got on that website as well. So it is really useful and really important. Um, and, and I have recently written a book, and in the process of writing the book, I needed to contact other people and hire them to do things for me. And any time that I looked for people and could not find them easily online, I gave up and looked for someone else instead. <coughs> and because of these people that I was able to find online, you know, they got money from me because I paid them to do things. Or they've given me images to use in my book, and now they're going to be famous when my book sells really well. Um, <laughs> But the point is that it, it is something that be, can be quite useful for someone to be able to access you serendipitously by finding you online. You, you can get opportunities, and, and I have gotten opportunities by simply having a web presence. Um, kind of related to that is the idea that having multimedia stuff posted online is quite useful. So even if you're not interested in doing any of those things professionally, um, you know, you've, maybe you've dabbled in having a YouTube channel, it is good to just, in whatever way, possible, just kind of link up lots of different types of sites. So one thing that I've done, for example, with my blogs, all of my science blogs, is that anytime I have images, um, I try to put them on Pinterest, or you could do a Tumblr account or whatever, but I, I cross-link them so that I, anyone who sees those images on Pinterest will then pop over to my blog, or people who are on my blog might pop over to Pinterest and then hop to my other blog, um, and, and, you know, again, you might have lots and lots of people who visit, not everyone is going to do this, but there are going to be a few who, who scroll through all of these connections, and by navigating their way through Facebook and Twitter and the blog and the Pinterest site and the Flickr site and all that stuff, they will start to get a sense of you and find out things about you and maybe come back as a regular um, reader or, I don't know, lover, a fan of your things. So it can be very useful to have all this stuff linked to it's also quite useful to have an editor at some point or another. Um, you know, maybe when you're first starting off, you want to have an editor who can kind of show you the ropes a bit. So if there's someone who has done this stuff before and knows what the audience is going to want or who is going to know what the editors will want, the publishers will want, that can be really useful just to make yourself more marketable. Um, but also, it's good just to have someone make sure that what you're doing is good quality. I still send my stuff to my parents to read because no one else has the time. Um, my mom is reading the latest draft of my book right now, so before
before I send it back to the publisher. Which sounds really silly, but it's a really good idea to have someone, whether it's another scientist who's kind of fact checking, or it's a non-scientist who's kind of checking for the way things look and sound. It can be really nice to have that second opinion, because after a while, you look at something so many times, you don't even see it straight anymore. And the same is true of assignments that you do in class as well. Now, the third kind of major category, and actually all these things are interrelated. You'll see that a lot of these things kind of, um, if you do one thing in one category, you're kind of at the same time doing things in another category. I've just separated them here for ease. But basically what you want to do is build a reputation. And this goes beyond just having a presence and being findable and having a place to kind of sell yourself. But you also want to, to make sure that people know who Caitlin Archite is, and what sort of person she is, and what sort of skills that she has. So you want to kind of inject your personality into things as well, and not just be the sum of your products. One way to do this is to join an organization, because then you will meet people who are also in that organization, and you can use it to network and to kind of, uh, if it's a physical thing that you go to, obviously you'll see people there. If it's kind of an online thing, you might go to the forum online and kind of chat whatever the case may be. But there are lots of different examples. So scientific organizations, nature organizations. If you're interested in editing, for example, there, there will be editing organizations, or if you're a writer, uh, this is a, a writing organization that I'm a part of. And all these things are useful, not just for the kind of networky things that I talked about, but also you can put them on your CV. Your CV always has a list of uh, the organizations you're part of, so the more ways in which you look active, the better. You also will find out about opportunities, so jobs that arise. Uh, you'll find out about kind of tips for making yourself better. So it's just kind of generally useful, as well as good for kind of marketing yourself. Just as I suggested that you attend scientific sorts of workshops and conferences in order to find out what's going on in the field, I also suggest that you attend workshops in order to kind of, kind of put yourself out there. And you can do that as a presenter in some way, but you can also do that as a participant in order to learn things. And this is particularly true when we're talking about workshops that are associated with skill sets. So a couple years ago, for example, I went to a workshop that was about science writing. Um, well, science communication. And to be honest, I actually found that the organization, um, the, the people who organized this, they were not very knowledgeable. They were kind of optimistic in organizing such an event. But the people who attended it were all really interested in communication. And they had all done it already. And they'd done it in lots of weird forms. I mean, there was a guy there who did like puppet shows in order to teach kids about science. And just having the chance to sit down with those people who had kind of done things, had things go wrong, had things go right, that was really informative because we could kind of trade stories and get tips and get feedback. And so being in that setting was quite useful. And now I know all of those people. And we kind of stay in touch. And actually, just two days ago, one of the guys that I met there sent me some sources to include in this book that I'm writing. Um, you know, so these sorts of things will come in handy, and people will know you. And down the line, that can be quite useful. And just in general, I keep saying now the word network and talking about networking. And that is something that's really good for you to do. And it's something that I actually really hate doing. I'm not a people person, and I think Actually, a lot of scientists are not particularly people, people, people. Um, but it is a really good idea to put yourself out there and kind of socialize and interview people and get experience talking with people. Um, one thing that can be quite useful if, if you want to kind of do something professional is to have a business card because that will make you feel very different and that will make people respond to you very different as well. Uh, so, for example, I had to or I got to cover uh, a kind of a kids in science thing that happened at a conference that I went to last summer. And before I did that, I made up these business cards because I thought people are going to be really freaked out if I show up with a camera and I'm like photographing all of their children. And so I had these business cards to make me look more official. And I would hand them out and say, can I photograph your child? Would that be all right? And they were quite you know, happy with that. And as soon as they do see that you are like professional, they react quite differently and they will ask you questions and they will tell you things. They might ask you, you know, can I get access to some of the stuff you've done? And if you've got your website on that card, then you can hand it to them and they can look you up later. 
So that can kind of change the whole atmosphere and make networking a bit easier because you do look like a real professional person. It's also quite useful to, to do lots of different stuff. So don't just dabble in what you know you want to do for sure. Go ahead and engage in any sorts of activities that come up along the way. Um, no matter how tangential they seem, they can often be quite useful and end up tying in to the kind of major theme. So for example, one thing that I do that is totally tangential is I've agreed to write the alumni column for uh, the place where I did my PhD. I don't care about alumni affairs at all. And I only agreed to do it because I thought this is something where I will regularly be forced to write, and I'll be forced to write something that's actually kind of hard to write, so it'll be a good exercise. Plus, every time that alumni magazine comes out, my name is up there as the contact person. People will see that. I can put it on my CV. Um, but also, you know, there are lots of alumni from my institution. They will read that. Some of them might eventually contact me for some reason. They'll know that I can write something, so that if they need something written, they might contact me. Um, so you know, just taking advantage of little opportunities like that to get your name out there, to show that you're active, to show that you have some sort of a skill, that can be quite a handy thing, even if on the surface of it, it seems kind of random. And something else that you might want to do is just actively contact people. And I mentioned already that it's always a good idea to contact people who are kind of active in the field if you want to ask them questions about their research, maybe because you want to cover it in some way. But it's also quite good to take advantage of any contacts that can get you an in. And I hate to say something like this because it sounds very kind of nepotistic, but the truth is that there are only a limited number of jobs and that there are lots of people who want those jobs. And anyone who has these sorts of connections, you can be sure they will use them if they can. And so you might as well use them if you can as well, because you don't want to be that one person who is standing out in the cold at the end of the day. So what you have to do is just kind of figure out where you feel comfortable and where you don't feel comfortable so you feel clean at the end of the day. But definitely take advantage of your friends and your acquaintances. Um, and this is something that I actually am quite personally weirded out by because my dad is a, a broadcaster, a journalist at a national organization in the US. It would be quite easy for me to go in and kind of take advantage of some of his ties. And I've always refused to do that. Um, it makes sense that I, since I'm living in the UK for me to continue refusing to do that. If I move back to the US and you know I had trouble getting a job, I might be very tempted to kind of you know call up these people that I know that he knows. And that sounds really bad, but the truth is other people will do it too. So you need to be willing to kind of just get in there and, and use these contacts if you've got them. Oops, that was, okay. <coughs> um, so this is just kind of a slide that I created to show my first 10 years as a science communicator. And it's not really because I think that I'm awesome and I want to share all my accomplishments, but it's more generally just to kind of give you an idea of how things can progress, just as kind of a case study. Um, and so all of this is stuff that I did when I was doing my master's and my PhD and my postdoc. So all this was done in my free time, which goes to show that you know this is not that remarkable, but there are several things up there. And I was just doing it kind of in my spare time. If you were to dedicate yourself, you could do lots more things and have quite a bigger exponential growth of what you produce. Um, so there are a couple of things that I think are interesting. And if I can figure out how to use the pointer, I would point them out. Uh, the first of them is that. So the very first thing that I ever published was poetry. And that just goes to show that you can start out doing something and then end up somewhere different. So don't be afraid to dabble in things and try them out. Just get yourself out there, get yourself on paper somewhere. It's all useful for the CV, it's all useful for your experience, it's all useful for marketing yourself. Don't think that you are gonna commit yourself to writing poetry forever just because you've got one poem, uh, one poem published. Another thing that actually I did mention earlier, uh, the very first thing that I started off doing that kind of got me on this path was thanks to a professor who suggested that I buy something called the Writer's Market. And that's something that's in the US. There's a UK version as well. It was in one of the earlier slides. I had a picture of it. But basically what it is is a, is a big tome that just lists all the different publications and what sort of focal point they have. Are they nature? Are they birdie? Are they science in general? And it will tell you if you can submit stuff to them freelance. And if you can, how do you go about doing it? 
and if they accept it, how much might you expect to make uh, from each article? So it's a bunch of really interesting and useful information about actually sending off your stuff. And I imagine that similar things can be found for other kind of realms of communication as well. But it's quite useful if you are a writer to get something like that so that you know who to target. Uh, because that is exactly what I did. I just looked at all the places that kind of seemed like they might take the sort of thing I produced, and I just started pumping out stuff and sending it to them. And the more you send, the more your chances are of, of eventually being accepted somewhere. Um, something else I just want to point out is that I've done lots of different sorts of things, as I said in the first slide. And one of the things that I eventually did was take my written stuff and turn it into PowerPoints that I would then give at meetings. And these are the sorts of things you can arrange yourself. So bird clubs, nature clubs of any kind, library gatherings, humanities groups, all sorts of people are interested in learning about new stuff. Uh, even if you're just talking to, what, what, what do you guys have? Boy Scouts? You know, Explorer Clubs, whatever they're called. Um, you know, groups like that. You can just find groups that want knowledge and tailor what you've already done to them. And that's a great thing that I kind of learned along the way, uh, that you can just kind of translate what you've done, twist it slightly, and use the same thing to produce lots of different stuff. And that will allow you to kind of pump up the volume of the number of things that you produce. Uh, finally, last year is when I did create my personal website, and that has actually been really helpful, just to kind of reiterate having your own website is really useful, and connecting it to lots of different stuff. And because I had that, I got people who would find me and say, would you review this book? We're going to send you this book for free. Would you write about it? Um, and that kind of thing. So it can be really nice. And when you've done a few of those, then you're kind of somebody, and you can approach a publishing company and say, hey, I've done a few of these. Can I do one for you? And they'll say, oh, yes, you are somebody. We'll send you this. Uh, so having that kind of profile out there is quite useful. And I think what, what that shows is that if you've got one experience, it will lead to another, and that will lead to another. And this stuff really does start to snowball. And as I said, I was only kind of half-heartedly doing all this because it was just what I did in the evenings. If you actually apply yourself to this and try to create the snowball effect, it, I think, will be even faster and even bigger. And just a, a specific case study, the very first thing that I published was in a nature magazine that also publishes book reviews. So once I had my first article, I had a chance to write a book review. And when I was writing the book review, I contacted the publisher to ask a question and found out in the process that they needed some authors to write some books. And that was how I got the chance to get a book contract uh, for this book that I just wrote. And so that is truly something where I would never have written this book and I would never have had the opportunity if I hadn't started off with that very first essay because things just progressed from there. So it really is true that if you just kind of start off somewhere, then things will develop. I do also just want to say, just to be honest and to warn people that it's not all fun and games either. Um, this fellow right here is David Quayman, who's one of my favorite authors, and he is a science writer. And when I was an undergrad, I wrote him and I said, I really want to be a science writer. What do you think about that? And he was nice enough to write back, and he said, don't do it. It's very hard. He said, unless you really love, in, you know, if you really love science writing, then do it. Otherwise, don't, because this is not for the faint-hearted. And I suspect that part of the reason he said that was that he was recovering from a horrible parasitic infection that he got in Africa um, while doing science writing. But the truth is that it is not the easiest thing. And I actually interviewed David last, uh, last year or two years ago, and I asked him about that letter, and I said, would you give me the same advice now? And he said, yes, I would absolutely give people the same advice. Staying um, staying in science writing is, or science communication is quite a difficult business and you should only go for it if you really love it and think you could do it uh, for the rest of your life. And the reason for that is that there are all these things you have to be willing to deal with. And part of that is the fact that you are not just writing for yourself, you're writing for an audience and that audience uh, is, it comes after a publisher or an editor and so you first have to Focus yourself to where the audience is, and then you have to change what you've done to make the editor or the publisher happy, or the broadcaster, or whoever. So you have to be revised. Um, you might be ignored. You might be turned down if you send something off. You are often going to be, when you're starting out, people are going to look down at you and say, who is this person? So you might be rebuffed, and it can be quite bad for your ego. 
Uh, you'll find all sorts of problems, especially that have to do with um, the time and money that you have to invest at the beginning. So I have a friend that I did my bachelor's degree with in science who went on to get a master's in science writing. And for a year or two after that, she did freelance work. And every time that she wanted to cover a story that she knew was a happening story that would get published, she had to pay to get herself to where that story was happening. She had to pay for the transportation, pay for the hotel, pay for the return trip, sit around writing the thing for a day or two, and then maybe at the end of all of that get paid, but maybe not. And so when you're doing, you know, that was, that was freelance. It's not always so bad when you've actually got a job, which is quite hard to get. But the point is it can be quite a thing that you have to invest lots of time and effort in and not always get something in return. So you do have to be kind of prepared to maybe work a second job or moonlight for a while before you kind of get established. It can be quite hard to just jump in and do this sort of thing full time uh, right off the bat. Uh, but the truth is that once you've kind of gotten over all these hurdles, it can be really rewarding because people are quite uh, interested and they can be quite inspired. And it can be, you know, for you, if you love science and you love to just kind of communicate and you, and you don't love the idea of writing grants and all that stuff, then it is a perfect compromise because you can kind of stay in the field that you love and keep up to date and rub elbows with all the people that are really interesting without having to deal with all the drawbacks. So there are also lots of good things to balance that out. And that is all I have to say about uh, you know, my own experiences and what I've learned. I'm quite happy to answer any specific questions, whether they come up now or whether you can go home and think about things and contact me later. And as I said, anything that I don't know off the top of my head, I probably know someone that can maybe give me some advice that I can then get to you. So if you have questions, fine. If you need to sneak out back, that's also fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the undergrads asked questions. <laughs>